Exploring tomorrow. And now here is your guide to these adventures of the mind, John Campbell, Jr. There's the old saying, you'll do it and like it. And, uh, of course, a man can, by physical force, make you do it. Uh, how would you like to have it so that you would like it, too? There are two basic ways that you can be happy in this world. One, of course, is to have everything you want in just the way you want it and never have any difficulties or troubles. This method is ideal, perhaps, but not very probable. Only one person in the world could have that, I guess. The other method uh, for absolute, complete happiness would be to like anything that you got, no matter what it was. The first approach is the one that makes sense, of course. That's the one we work for. We earn it. The other seems so much easier. Stop barking. Stop barking. Stop barking. Stop barking. No, 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 that, that's all right, doggy. You bark as much as you want. <laughs> oh, how I wish I could get mad. In the old days, I'd have gone up that dog and told him to shut up, and that had been that, but no more. Just as soon as I start to get good and sore about something, my mind kind of all creams up in the happiness effect, and I'm not sore anymore. And everybody here in Benton, I guess most everybody in the country is just like me. We've all had our brains written on, and we're all happy. Here I am, chief of police of Benton, and there were a crime to speak of, unless it's overtime air parking, and what kind of crime you call that. Henry! Henry! Oh, here he comes. Our own Doc Roy, the man responsible for all our happiness. He's supposed to be just about the best brain rider this side of the Mississippi. Henry, Henry! Slobbo, that's what I call him. Old wet lips always do good and always grinning. But behind that grin, believe me, ice. If you need an enemy, just have Doc Royden for a friend. Henry, Henry, didn't you hear me calling to you? Oh, sorry, Doc. I guess I just kind of stand here thinking. Uh, happy thoughts, I hope. Oh, sure, happy thoughts, sure, sure. Uh, well, what can I do for you, Doc? Uh, a fellow just came into town, suspicious, uh, painting pictures out at Willow Hollow. There's law against painting pictures at Willow Hollow? Now, Henry, you know I've got to keep my eyes on things. Wasn't for us brain writers, there'd be all kinds of irresponsibles roaming around. And these artists, they're the worst kind, you know that. You remember there was a day when you were headed for that kind of trouble? Yeah, I remember. I was a pretty good baritone, too. You sure brain wrote me out of that note. And aren't you better for it? You're a responsible citizen, happily married, well-adjusted, doing a job that's socially useful. Yeah. <laughs> what about this fellow I'm supposed to investigate? The name of Arnold Vivian. And he's been painting up at Willow Hollow? That's right. Doesn't do anything all day long but paint. Single. No wife, no children, no nothing. He just paints. Well, remember, as long as he just paints, that's legal. Now, Henry. Now, don't Henry me, Doc. I'll look into it. That's all I can promise. All right. That's all I ask. Right. Goodbye, Henry. <laughs> Mighty pretty landscape you're painting. Why, thank you. <laughs> Willow Hollow makes a mighty pretty landscape to paint. Well, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Oh, no, that's all right. I never mind a little talk when I'm painting. What uh, can I do for you? Your name Arnold Vivian. That's right. I'm Henry Horner, Chief of Police. Nice to meet you. Chief of... What, uh, what seems to be the trouble? No, no trouble. i just out here to give you a kind of friendly warning. About what? Now, this town of Benton you're in needs new young men, Arnold. If you should happen to get in any trouble here, we got a real fast brain rider who likes to straighten people out. I don't get into trouble. Well, just keep in mind, we need workers these days. Like our brain rider would say, who needs pictures on canvas? Who needs pictures on canvas? Why, Mr. Policeman, me. Maybe someday a few others will agree with me. 
Well, maybe. I used to be a sort of artistic fella myself. Baritone uh, concert style. Yeah. I'll bet you're good on a police whistle, too. Don't worry about me, Mr. Horner. Just go back and tell your brain writer. Here's one traveling man he won't ever get to use his scalpel on. <laughs> Saturday night, Benton has a dance. I usually don't go near it myself because since the brain writing, everybody's pretty well adjusted and ain't any police-type trouble. This Saturday night, though, I dropped in toward the middle of the evening. Hi, Mr. Horner. Hi, hello, Arnold. Having a good time? Heck yes. I've been dancing with all the girls. They love me and I love them. Staying out of trouble? The only trouble I ever have is with pictures on canvas. Well, don't go getting drunk and sign a job contract with Big Fellum at the Brickyard or with Tom Hearth or you'll forget pictures. I'm immune to job contracts. Also, it may interest you to know that both Mr. Hearth and Mr. Fellum each bought a painting for me tonight, paid cash on the bar. Well, that's a surprise. Well, I wonder what they're up to. Well, why should they be up to anything? They just like my pictures. <laughs> I guess they like me, too. They invited me to play poker with them after the dance tonight. You turned them down, of course. Heck no. I like taking money from people at poker. Well, they're more likely to do the taking, and once you're broke, you'll just have to go to work. Mr. Horner, when are you going to stop worrying about me? I told you, I can take care of myself. And he could, too. When the poker game broke up about 3 a.m., he was the winner. Everybody was griping, all except Doc Royden, who sat there, his close-set eyes glittering behind thick spectacles. Imagine him taking me for 30 bucks. Imagine. You know, he knows people, he knows cars, he knows women. You're not going to brain right that boy. You want to bet, Henry? You just want to make a little bet. <laughs> Whether it's a crowded highway or a narrow street, a smooth, even flow of traffic is one of the essentials of safe driving. Speeding is an obvious hazard, but it can also be suicide. Slowpoke driving is dangerous, too, because it causes rear-end collisions and tempts other motorists into taking deadly chances in passing. The eccentric behavior of the lane switcher, the driver who weaves in and out, often is the cause behind frightful smash-ups. So don't be a cause, and don't be a victim. Arrive alive. There are two difficulties with the happiness idea. One of them is that actually we need to earn happiness to enjoy it, so that we don't really want to work for it. The drug addict has happiness uh, that he doesn't have to work for, really. The other difficulty is uh, happiness in whose terms? Many times, you know, the other fellow figures that you ought to be happy with what he's giving you. Henry, wake up and scoot over to Tony Holland's shack on the edge of the holla. What's the matter, Doc? There's been a crime. Get over here as fast as you can. Somebody's got to keep an eye on our citizens at the police force. Now, huh? wait a minute. Well, it's a good thing I was out this way. Where's Tony? I gave him a sleep injection. The poor fellow, he was bashed on the head and all his savings were stolen. Three hundred and two dollars. Well, can't you wake him up so he can tell me himself? No need. I got all the information you'll want. Who does he think did it? He doesn't know, but I've got a good idea. Yeah, like who? Well, let's eliminate it. Couldn't have been a passing tramp since brainwriting the aunt, any. And if you can't say it was anyone in town, they're all adjusted and wouldn't commit no crimes. So? Might be somebody around who wanders in the holler in the daytime, poking around and pretending to be what he ain't. Well, it wasn't Arnold Vivian. How do you know? Because he's not that stupid. He knows he'd be the most likely suspect. Maybe you'd just better check up on him, Henry. Doc, you're the brain writer. They called you in after the maladjusted guy's been caught, but I'm the cop. I run my investigations the way I want, and I'm not going to build a case against Arnold Vivian. What are you going to do? You write on brains. Try reading one. <laughs> So 
Well, you figure Doc Royden's trying to frame me, huh? Looks that way. Oh, it's ridiculous. I just took you people at poker for enough money to live for three weeks. Why should I take a chance on getting my head written on? Have you missed any of your stuff? Oh, just my pen and pencil set that I lost jumping around at the dance last night. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. That'd make a fine clue, wouldn't it, at the scene of the crime? It sure would. Well, was it found over there? Not yet, but it will be. That's not important, though. What is important is this. Tony Holland has one peculiarity. He marks $20 bills. Figures he can follow how the money goes around town that way. Now, you don't draw any money from the local bank or in salary, so you just better not have any local $20 bills marked by Tony. Hey, whose side are you on? I used to sing baritone, remember? <laughs> Police, I like you. Artist, I kind of like you, too. Henry. Look what we found at Tony's. Look here. Yeah, I know. You found a clue, a pen or a pencil or both. We know all about it, Doc. Arnold, I better run you in, at least until we can investigate further. It'll look better. Why, certainly. No trouble at all, Mr. Horner. Glad to come along. I pressed for a hearing right away, figuring that Arnold could be cleared and then leave town. He figured the same, that it wasn't healthy to hang around a place that needed new talent so bad. The hearing went real fine from the start. I testified that Arnold had been fast asleep at the time the crime was committed, and I swore that the pen and pencil had been planted in Tony's house. Then suddenly they were talking about Mark twenty dollar bills. Well, I couldn't I couldn't possibly have any twenties, Judge. I just told you I I there's absolutely no way that I could have unless uh, No. No. Let me out of here! Let me out of here! It's a frame-up! It's a frame-up, I tell you! It's... There is no tool that is either good or evil. There's nothing that in itself is good or bad. It's the way it's used. Logic is a wonderful thing, of great value to man and his progress. But in this uh, trial here... You've seen what can be done with logic when someone is out to prove what he wants to prove and is not in the slightest interested in getting the truth. There's just one thing I want to say. I've seen a lot of raw deals, but the way you have it here with the singing cop to set it up is the slickest I ever saw. You win. <laughs> As chief of police, I had to be present at the brain riding. Doc's nurse gave Arnold the needle jab in the back of the neck, and after that, he sat there like a stone man, able to hear, but paralyzed. Now, now, Henry, there we are. Yes, yes, the clay model is ready to take the impressions from Arnold's brain, so we'll have an exact duplicate. Now we put this cap on Arnold's head, so the electronic fingers in it can do the measuring. That's a good boy. It won't take long now. Attach these wires to the automatic computer that we put above the clay model, and there we are. An exact model of Arnold's brain. All right, let's take a look. Oh, me, oh, my. There's a brain that needs writing. All right, all right, all right. Look here, you see that? Decayed memory spots, artistic imagination, decayed sensory impressions, quite useless in an adjusted society. Now, we just take the scalpel and start doing away with these six synapses in the brain model, substituting good ones. Isn't that what we do, Henry? Yeah, that's what we do, all right. You erase the bad ones and carve some good ones, and then when his own brain gets the impression, the guy's adjusted from then on. Everybody does what they should, and they don't need no religion, no morals, no psychology, nothing. Just brain ripening, and the world's work gets done. Now, Henry, you always miss the most important part. After I get rid of the illogical synapses, I do one special cut with my stylus. There, there, I'm doing it now. And that's the happiness effect. Then your adjusted man not only does what he ought to, he's happy about it. <laughs> There we are. Oh, that looks beautiful. Oh, that looks almost like the master brain. 
Let me get it and show it to you, Henry. It's real interesting. I'll be back in a second. You know, Arnold, I sure wish I could help you. Wait a minute. Maybe I can. I'm going to try to put back some of those synopses he cut out. Here's a scalpel. You know, there's one he did. There's another. Maybe I can help you keep some of your artistic talent, Arnold. Yeah, here's a final one. That one day, Henry will be able to duplicate this master brain in everyone. It's brilliant. Take a look at it while I prepare for the transference from the clay model to Arnold's brain. It sure is fine looking, this master brain. Yes, yes, yes. Now we're ready to go. Now, Henry, Henry, when I close this switch... The new brain shape will flash the signal to the cap on Arnold's head. The electronic fingers will dig in, and he'll have a new brain. Oh, I tell you, Henry, this is the real moment of birth. Most people are born wrong for this world. This is where they get right. All right, here we go. It's going to hurt a little. <laughs> well, Henry, we did it. We created a useful citizen. So six months went by, and it looked as if Doc was right. Arnold took a job, settled down, got himself married, and then... Henry, Henry, have you seen that picture exhibition up at the town hall? Picture exhibition? No, Doc. What's it about? Arnold, Billy, and the sneak. Pictures of me holding me up to ridicule. I'll be the laughing stock of this town. You've got to stop it. Well, there's nothing illegal about pictures, Doc, but come on, let's take a look. town hall, and there was the neatest collection of pictures you ever saw. Arnold had painted Doc Royden more than 50 times, and in each picture he cut the basic evil of the man. Doc was shown at the council meeting, at church, at the dance, his face revealing every grimace of deceit, power, lust, conniving. Every picture was titled The Happiness Effect, and everyone was marked sold already. I knew then and there that Doc Royden was finished in battle. Henry, please, I'm too old to start over in another town. I've got to stay in Benton. Please, Henry, get rid of those pictures. Why, Doc, it sounds to me like you're maladjusted to your environment. You ought to be brain-ridden to the happiness. Henry! Henry! Henry, man, I've been looking all over for you. I wanted to tell you thanks for using Doc's scalpel to save a piece of my talent. Why, it was a pleasure, Arnold. Thanks to you for giving us back a little human dignity. people tend to think that happiness is something you have. But I think it isn't. I think it's more in the nature of something you do. You know, the founders of our country were no fools. And in the Declaration of Independence, they said that men had certain inalienable rights, among which were the pursuit of happiness. No man has ever declared that happiness itself is a right of man. The pursuit of happiness is. It's worth working for. Join us for a fascinating adventure in Exploring Tomorrow. Heard in our cast tonight were Mason Adams, Charlie Holmes, and Lawson Zerby. The script was taken from a story by Raymond Banks. Produced and directed by Sanford Marshall here in New York. Bill Maher speaking. We pause now for station identification. <laughs>